The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey everybody, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. Um, this might be a different voice than you were expecting. Uh, if you're not familiar with me, uh, my name is Thomas DeToy. You can call me Thomas or Mr. DeToy either way. Um, I taught Wednesdays in the fall class, and I'm back to teach Wednesdays in this semester as well. Yeah, I am back. <laughs> so those of you who are familiar with me, hello, nice to see you again. Those of you who are not, I am sorry, um, you're stuck with me. Well, so here's the deal. I know we've been designing a phone case, um, but we're actually gonna take a slight detour. Oh, thank you, Cohen. Um, we're gonna take a slight detour. It's glad to be, I'm glad to be back. Um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time reviewing um, what you guys went over on Monday. And then we're going to talk about the Falcon 9 Heavy launch, um, which was pretty dang cool. Uh, so we'll, we'll we'll discuss all of that. Uh, that'll probably take a good amount of the class. And then, um, you know, if we have any leftover time, we'll probably get started on the next project, which is also a phone case. Um, and I'll get you guys all set up to be good to go for Monday. Uh, but we're probably going to spend the majority of the class today talking about that launch. Um, and it's, it's good to have a little, you know, break from, from uh, uh, Fusion 360 and stuff like that. And it'll also be good for me. I'm a little bit out of sorts today. I apologize. Um, just uh, had a whole little um, sort of medical emergency with a, with a pet and, and uh, arranged for the, the surgery and everything like that today. It came out. Everything's fine. Um, they're they're uh, they're going to be back in the house tomorrow, but it was uh, it was just sort of a long day. So uh, yeah, um, if I start doing the exact thing that I was just doing, where I say um a lot and kind of trail off, I apologize in advance. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, get started with a little bit of review, and then we will uh, we'll jump into our our intermission for today. So you guys created a phone case. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Like I said, he, he came out of uh, sedation and uh, apparently he's, he's uh, just charming all of the, all of the vets there. So he's, he seems to be okay, but I appreciate it. Um, you guys were Designing a phone case, um, and as I understand it, you guys actually got done with the first phone case. Aha, uh -huh, I said the first phone case. Some of you might be going, wait, what? Uh, there is a more complex one to be working on after this. But yeah, you guys certainly got the first one done. Um, you know, you, we got, you got started, uh, you know, from the very beginning, just sort of drawing a rectangle all in millimeters. Um, the reason he did it in millimeters is because uh, even though we're very used to, uh, you know, inches and stuff like that, and it's pretty clear that the iPhone was designed with that in mind as well, considering it's got some pretty uh, ugly measurements, 138.3 millimeters, 67.1 millimeters. Um, let's go ahead and see about converting those to inches, 138.3 millimeters to inches is, well, okay, so it doesn't really translate very nicely either to inches. 67.1 millimeters. Yeah, no, never mind. All right, that's just what they could fit it in. Good to be wrong. All right, so, um, yeah, 138.3 millimeters, 67.1 millimeters. Uh, it's kind of, it's kind of ugly, it's kind of weird, but it's good to get used to the metric system as well. Um, the metric system is, it's a nice system. It's not one we use in America, but if you're going into the science or engineering fields, it will be one that you use. Um, if you want to communicate uh, with the rest of the world, it's going to be one that you're going to use. So it's good to get familiar with it uh, just because uh, we, uh, as a nation, are not an island, um, literally and figuratively. Uh, you know, we interact with the rest of the world. So here are some different sizes for the iPhone. Uh, this was the reason why this is listed here is because this was the specs here for an iPhone 7, but you guys might want to build one for an iPhone 8 or an iPhone 10 
um, or uh, or an A plus or whatever. Then you extruded that rectangle and created a box out of it, a rectangular prism, and uh, then you filleted, filleted the corners. Um, basically rounded them off on a 10 millimeter thing and uh, it closer approximated the design of an iPhone. You did the same thing with the front and back of it, again, becoming ever closer to the sort of the, the, the bezel that an iPhone has and use that as the base model in order to build a box around it. Then you created that box, surrounded it around the, uh, the phone case, or excuse me, around the phone model, then sort of molded the uh, the the curves of the box and everything like that, so it, it was a uh, a uh, still a phone case, but sort of closer to a design that worked for you, uh, gave it a little bit of your fingerprint, so to speak, and then uh, basically cut the phone out of the case, so you had uh, a nice phone-shaped hole in your phone case. And it was a very, it's a very simple, simple case. I mean, you know, you're not going to be able to press like any of the buttons on the side or anything like that. But if you've got an iPhone X, you're not going to have any buttons on the side anyway, if I remember correctly. I don't know. I haven't really been following the iPhones all that much, to be perfectly honest. Um, so it might be a moot point anyway. But uh, there's got to be like volume buttons or something like that. Anyway, regardless, point is... Uh, this is a much simpler phone case, and the next design involves um, a more complicated one that can take that kind of stuff into account and everything. So there's your first phone case, though. And it was exciting, and the people rejoiced. <sighs> now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about space. SpaceX Falcon Heavy. Uh, well, it's certainly not the largest rocket ever built. It is among the most powerful. Um, the Saturn V, uh, in terms of sheer size, is a larger rocket. Um, however, the Falcon Heavy is able to take uh, heavier payloads to low Earth orbit, if I'm understanding correctly. In fact, uh, let's just pull up a little, a nice little infographic about the... Um, Falcon Heavy versus the Saturn V, as far as size is concerned. Oh, there's this one as well. Yeah, it was. It was yesterday. All right. All right, some of these have um, hypothetical rockets in there. Um, but as you can see, the Falcon Heavy, well, a pretty sizable rocket. The Saturn V was a monster. On top of that, there is the Delta IV Heavy, which is roughly the same size. Now, here's the deal. The Falcon Heavy is a very specialized rocket. Or, excuse me general purpose, the opposite of specialized. The Saturn V was a very specialized rocket. The Saturn V, the entire point of that rocket was to take people to the moon. Uh, so it had a bunch of specialized stages exactly for that. The Falcon Heavy is just meant to take big stuff up really high into the sky. Uh, there's no real, you know, uh, specific mission handed down to it from on high. Um, you can use it to launch uh, satellites, vehicles, eventually people, um, maybe a car. I don't know. Maybe maybe a car. Just speaking in general terms here. Um, but yeah, so the Falcon 9, or excuse me, the Falcon Heavy. I keep wanting to call it the Falcon 9 Heavy because it is a variant of the Falcon 9. The Falcon Heavy is uh, a very general purpose rocket. And that's its point. Its point is, you know, yeah, you want to get something big put up really high in the sky, you call SpaceX for that. 
Doesn't matter. Is it people? Yeah, we'll put them up there. Is it a is it a satellite? Yeah, we'll put it up there. Is it a really big bird? No, well, it's kind of weird, but yeah, we'll put it up there. You know, so it's it's meant to launch um, something into space, regardless of you know customer or payload. And the this is a very intentional design because this is meant to be a commercial rocket. Yeah, a Tesla Roadster. But again, not speaking in specifics or anything like that. Um, so those are just some of like the main differences between it and the Saturn V. It's a smaller rocket. Um, it may not be able to push something as far as the Saturn V, um, but it is um, the fuel to rate, weight ratio is better, and it is a more generalized rocket. So from that perspective. Those are some pretty big improvements over the Saturn V. Now let's compare it to the Falcon 9. So the Falcon 9, you know, it's old hat, sisters, yesterday's news. We already know it launches. You know, it's it's pretty well man rated and everything like that. The Falcon Heavy is not yet man rated. That doesn't mean that it cannot launch people. It just means that it has not gotten the go ahead from the government that it's okay to launch people on it. Um, and there are a number of reasons why this is uh, a test that needs to be done. You want to make sure that, um, you know, if there were any hypothetical people inside, they wouldn't be uh, experiencing too many G-forces uh, whenever the rocket rotates or is accelerating or anything like that, because you want people to come out of the other end pretty okay. Um, you want to make sure that they have the ability to uh, abort the mission in case something goes wrong with the rocket, because they're people and you want to make sure that they're okay. You want to make sure that they don't experience too much vibration from the rockets firing because they're, well, you guessed it, people, and you want to make sure they're okay. So the, there's basically a whole battery of tests that rockets need to go through in order to become man-rated. Um, Falcon Heavy has not gone through that kind of stuff yet. And to my knowledge, I believe Falcon 9 is, but it has not launched people yet. Um, and that's because that actually SpaceX is also developing a specialized capsule for the Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy, and that is the Dragon. The Dragon capsule is pretty cool. It's it's uh, like an Apollo capsule on steroids. It can seat, I think, eight people. And it's got all kinds of blinky lights and screens in it and uh, super plush seats. And neato indirect lighting with neon lights and stuff like that like it's like it's like the apollo mission and tron had a baby um and it's it's excuse me the apollo capsule and tron had a baby and it's pretty cool um i would i would urge you guys to check it out at some point um if we don't check it out in this class but anyway um the falcon 9 is the basically the vanilla flavor rocket from spacex and the reason why it's called the falcon 9 is because it has nine nozzles on the bottom um thus allowing it to provide maximum thrust for the fuel it's given um but yes so the falcon 9 the base cost to launch one considered the paid in full um launch price is 56.5 million that's basically just enough to get the fuel ready to go and get that thing up into space and back down um now there could be additional costs incurred based on the weight of your uh payload and you know where it needs to go and stuff like that but that's enough to get it onto the launch pad and going somewhere um so 56.5 million dollars for the uh for the uh for the launch a falcon heavy on the other hand is well its cost is separated into two categories um if whatever you're looking to launch is 6.4 tons or less, it's $77.1 million. If it's greater than 6.4 tons, it's $135 million to launch. So it's a pretty significant step up from 56.5 million. Uh, we're looking at a little bit over double the amount. However, things really start to change when you look at the amount of weight they can take into space respectively. The Falcon 9 is able to take 13,000 150 kilograms into low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit is basically the lowest stable orbit that is generally used in space flights. Um, kind of could guess that from the name, probably, considering it's low Earth orbit. It's a low orbit around the Earth. But regardless, uh, that's what that term means. Um, this is generally a pretty nice circle uh, around 
if not the equator, you know, that general area-ish. Um, so that's a decent amount of weight. That's actually almost 29,000 pounds in, uh, you know, America units, standard units, they're called imperial units, something. Uh, anyway, um, which is... <sighs> 15 tons yeah about 15 tons so you can take about 15 tons to low earth orbit with a falcon 9 and um with the geosynchronous transfer orbit now geosynchronous transfer orbit is a whole different beast the geosynchronous part is uh what that means is that it will stay basically over the same point on the Earth. That is to say, its orbit is the same speed as the Earth's rotation. If something were to be in geosynchronous orbit above your head, no matter what time of day it was, it would be over your head. Now, it might be a little bit further north or a little bit further south, but it's going to be over your head. It might be a lot further south or a lot further north, but whatever. Anyway, um, it's going to be over your head. The transfer orbit part is uh, basically it means that so when when you know you're launching astronauts to the moon and stuff like that and you know buggies and whatever to Mars um, certainly the moon one of the one of the more common and simpler orbits though not necessarily the most efficient orbit uh, is a Hohmann transfer uh, and what that basically involves is that basically involves creating a transfer orbit and then making so speeding up once you hit that transfer orbit, just go faster and faster and faster. And what that does is that makes the, uh, let me pull out my handy dandy paint. So you've got your, here's your, here's the ARF. It's nice, round. Um, here's your geosynchronous transfer orbit. I look like I drew a really bad egg. Um, and the whole idea is uh, somewhere around here, you start speeding up more, just applying more force. And what that ends up doing is that it ends up making the orbit longer on one end with the intention that, hey, look, here's the moon. So eventually you get to a point where your orbit is long enough to encapsulate both the Earth and the moon. And you do that while you're sort of flying towards it. And then you get to a point here and you start flying the other way. And then you make, you bring in this end of the, uh, of the orbit Oops. So eventually you start looking like that and like that. And then you get a nice little orbit around whatever other celestial body you want it to be at. Geosynchronous transfer orbit allows you to do that. Um, that's basically a staging orbit so that you can move to another celestial body. So in order to get to geosynchronous transfer orbit, um, you can take a Falcon 9 and you can take up to 4,850 kilograms, which is about 11,000 pounds. So about five tons in American units, uh, five and a half. Um, so 15 tons to low Earth orbit, five and a half tons to geosynchronous transfer orbit, which is a lot of stuff, big, big amount of stuff. Um, but sometimes you want to take more stuff. So 6.4 tons to geosynchronous transfer orbit, um, Already, if you want to take more than five tons, but less than 6.4 tons, you can take the Falcon Heavy, and that's 77.1 million. So it's a, it's a bit of a price bump. However, you can take greater than 6.4 tons of, or, or of uh, whatever to GTO. How much, you might say? Well, for a Falcon Heavy, low Earth orbit is 53,000 kilograms, 13,000 to 53,000. That's 116, almost 117,000 pounds, which is 58 tons. Yeah, 58 tons. So from 15 to 58 tons. And then for geosynchronous transfer orbit, GTO, um, that's 21,200 kilograms or 46,000, almost 47,000 pounds. So that's um, 
what uh, math 23.5 tons so from 5 to 23.5 tons so the falcon heavy has a dramatic performance increase over the falcon 9. anyway you weren't here to look at numbers you were here to watch the falcon heavy launch and landing because that's the other critical part of the falcon 9 and the falcon heavy is it is reusable this is one of the biggest problems that we dealt with with the space shuttle and uh, with a huge part of the Saturn V. A lot of it we ended up throwing out. Uh, it just burned up on re-entry. Um, for the space shuttle, if we managed to recover the two solid rocket boosters on the side, great day. Not always guaranteed though, and we had to basically strip everything down and just almost rebuild it from scratch um, just because so much of it needed to be redone after every launch uh, that big old fuel tank on it though forget about it that thing burned up on re-entry and was useless uh, so you always had to basically make a new fuel tank one of those big orange ones on the side of the space shuttle every time you wanted to launch a new one that's a huge amount of money um, the saturn V, most of those stages uh, were not recoverable after that thing launched that's a huge amount of money the analogy i've always heard is imagine you started a restaurant up and every time you served a customer before the next customer came in you just took all the dishes and all the furniture and everything like that and you just threw it in a big fire in the back and then you just built new stuff from scratch and then refurbished like refurnished the restaurant and got all kinds of new dishware and everything like that that's kind of what commercial space flight has been in the past and government space flight has been in the past now this is not a commentary on commercial versus government this is not a commentary on libertarianism versus you know uh socialism or anything like that i am not going in that direction even remotely all i'm saying is that's the way it's been in the past and this is how they're trying to change it in the future um so the falcon is meant to be much more reusable how much more reusable, you might ask. You may already know. If you don't know, you're in for a surprise. Well, first off, the cargo. The reason why we were talking about the Tesla is because Elon Musk was very confident in his Falcon 9. In fact, he was so confident that he launched his personal Tesla into space with a dummy in it. Um, so that Tesla right there, that's not just any Tesla. That's Elon Musk's. So let's see here. Um, actually, let me bring up a picture right now because I think this is a pretty interesting thing. Uh, this was something that was brought up. Um, so the commentary on this picture was brought up to my attention. I thought it was kind of neat. Consider this actual picture of his Tesla in Earth orbit. This is this is a real picture of it. There's the dummy, there's the Tesla. It was a successful launch. It is currently orbiting the Earth, never to return. That reflection on there is the Earth. This is the first time in history that the entire Earth has been reflected on the side of a car. Think about that for a second. Yeah. And it might be, who knows? It's too early to say that it's the only time in history that'll happen. But stuff like this, this is going to be the kind of stuff that is going to be published in history books in the future. Stuff like this launch is going to be the kind of stuff that's published in history books in the future. This is was an historic event. And part of the reason why it's so historic and why they're so reusable yeah, exactly. Check out my ride and view. Um, why it's so historic, why it's so reusable, is because the boosters land themselves. Like 50s B-movie sci-fi rockets. They land straight up back on the dang old Earth. This is a just completely mind-boggling feat of engineering. The amounts of sensitive electronics and precision engineering and just Byzantine and arcane coding that has to go into making something like this possible is just this shy of black magic. It's not really though, it's totally achievable because we did it. And that's the amazing thing. But you guys don't care about a picture. Let's actually watch it happen. 
So I'm going to go ahead and pull it up. And I'm not going to pull it up with this link because this link is broken. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, Falcon 9 Heavy, Falcon Heavy Launch. So let's see here. Videos. Let's find. Oh. I don't know why I'm overcomplicating this. Why don't I just go into my history? Because I just watched it. All right, so I'm. I'm going to go ahead and link this video into the chat, and I'm going to play it on my computer. Um, I'm going to mute myself, just sort of unmuting myself periodically to provide commentary here and there. Um, but if you haven't seen it before, I highly recommend you, you click the link and check it out. Um, if you've already seen it before, hey, it's cool to watch a second time. And it's 10 minutes, you know, 10 minutes well spent. Um, but I'm going to mute myself so that you don't get like a that duplication of the sound or anything like that if you watch it on your own computer. Uh, but presented with very minimal commentary is the Falcon Heavy launch from yesterday. So you might notice at this point that the rocket starts to rotate and tilt, and that's done in order to actually create that orbit. A rocket never goes straight up. Uh, what it basically has to do is it has to be going sideways fast enough to miss the Earth. So what they do is they rotate it and tilt it so it starts accelerating sideways and creates a parabola. Now this rocket doesn't, the rocket itself doesn't actually hit orbit, but in order to propel its payload to orbit, it does the same thing.
Here comes the separation. So it should be noted that the two bottom views are actually the two separate boosters. It's not the same view repeated twice, but that's just how much precision there is in the uh, in the deployment on this. There's the payload. And 10 totally imaginary useless points to anybody who can get the reference that is on the uh, dashboard screen of the car when it is deployed. And again, I'm going to reiterate this, and I think they stress it again in the video too. Those two bottom ones are the left and right booster. They are not the same shot. That is just how exactly how uh, precise everything is.
And here's the thing that makes them reusable. I was muted that whole time. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I think that's pretty incredible. Um, yeah, I, I hope at some point that that, an event like that becomes mundane, which is such a, is a strange thing to say, but hear me out. Um, it happened to the Apollo missions, moon missions, and it happened to, to a certain extent, the space shuttle launches, but it never really did. Like the space shuttle launches and landings, it was still an event every time it happens. Um, but by the time the last Apollo mission to the moon was landing on it, it was televised just like you know, Apollo 11. Uh, however, there were, unlike the entire nation, you know, pretty much watching the Apollo 11 moon landing, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but more people actually watched the Super Bowl uh, landing of, I believe it was Apollo 17? I think Apollo 17 was the last one. And um, it was not amazing. However, I think we went to space for the wrong reasons then. Sure, there was adventure and there was, you know, discovery and, and pushing the boundaries of human exploration. But a lot of the main reasons why we did it was to prove that we were better than the Soviets and to establish a uh, technological dominance and uh, a foothold in space if we needed to. When we got there, we found out that we didn't really need to, and we didn't know what to do with space after that. Sure, we had ideas, but none of them were really as viable as they seem nowadays. So the idea of space exploration uh, it's sort of like we, we started to run before we really learned how to walk, before we learned how to crawl even, almost. Um, 
so that's a big part of the reason why we stopped going to the moon. Uh, a lot of things seem more pressing here on Earth. Uh, the American public didn't really understand why we would want to continue to go there. Uh, and it was an easy target for budget cuts. Now that's to say, not to say that NASA is getting less money than they were in the past. It's actually historically getting, or it's getting more money than it has in the past. However, its percentage of the national budget, budget has not kept pace. And that's why we don't really see as much um, potential out of it as we could. Uh, add to that, that there is sort of a, a hurdle to get over with space flight. Um, and that is the gravity well. It's notoriously, cripplingly hard to get things out of the gravity well on a regular basis. Um, so that was another thing that people struggled with. Anyway. Nowadays, it seems like it's a much more viable option. There are things that we can do out there in space more so than we could in the past. There are uh, more technologies we, that we can leverage in order to get them up there into space more easily and cheaply than we could in the past. There are more interests wanting to get into space than there were in the past. You know, there is more of a drive to do it for exploration's sake than there has been in the past. Um, and for that reason, we're seeing sort of a resurgence of space launches. So who knows what the future is going to hold? But my hope is that the launches themselves will become commonplace. And people will sort of regard it like they do plane flying. Go, oh, well, you know, oh, I had to wait forever to get, you know, whatever. Uh, or, you know, our, our flight got delayed because there was another there was another space flight or something like that. Like our flight to JFK got delayed because there was a launch out of Canaveral. Sure, it'd be annoying, but I think you guys are here because you're all interested in some degree or another in some aspect of science and technology. And I have confidence that you guys won't take that kind of stuff to, for granted. And um, I also have confidence that it's going to be people like you, like you guys, that are going to really sort of push the forefront of that kind of thing, make the, the next history making and eventually mundane thing that will push forward the, you know, the frontiers of human exploration and technology and development. And, you know, maybe maybe space isn't your bag. Maybe, like, you know, you don't want to design rockets. That's fine. That's not necessarily the case. If you look at that video of the number of people who were ex just absolutely ecstatic at the launch, and you realize just how many hands go into something like this. You get people who are, you know, they're, they're, they're maybe not in any part of the, the aerodynamics aspect, but they're designing the telemetry software that determines where it is over the Earth and relative to, you know, other celestial bodies in the solar system. You've got the people who are um, working in material sciences to develop, you know, high strength, high tensile strength materials to form the 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 rocket boosters and stuff like that. You might be somebody who's working in chemical engineering in order to find a new highly reactive fuel mixture that can be used. You might be somebody who's working in engineering in order to, to create, you know, the designs for the next uh, commercial orbiting space station. Who knows? Point being, there are a whole bunch of different disciplines that go into it, an innumerable amount of disciplines that go into it. And everything works together it's it's like that phrase you know everybody's standing on the shoulders of giants we don't we don't reinvent the wheel every time the next generation comes around we build upon what the previous generation has learned and that's why we've gotten as far as we have and you know for you guys to be able to build upon what's happening here is a really exciting prospect so remember this event because Hopefully, we see the something we we see the start of something that's just amazingly different, and new, and exciting, and like the kind of stuff that they talked about in you know popular science magazines in the fifties and sixties, maybe just with better designs. Anyway, with that in mind, 
found cases. And I know that's that's actually a very uh, sort of fall from rocketry and space flight and all that kind of stuff. But hey, if you're going to be working with this kind of stuff, you need to get familiar and comfortable with computer-assisted design software. And what better way to do that but to, you know, wax on, wax off, just make things, you know, over and over again until you're until you're uh, you can do it with your eyes closed and you know exactly how it works. So the next part of the project is going to involve a more advanced uh, phone model to build a case off of. So we're going to take into account, you know, the power button and the volume buttons and stuff like that that might exist on an iPhone. Um, with that in mind, there is a link to a more um, a more complicated phone design that I'm going to give to you guys. So let me go ahead and scrounge up that link now and give it to you guys. Uh, go ahead and download the zip file, and then you'll have that zip file available for Monday when you get started on um, the next phone case. So let me go ahead and do that. Pause the screen real quick like. Um, oops. Get link. Link sharing on. Let me just check the validity of the link. Anyone, anyone with the link can access. Uh, whoops. There we go. I'll just link it again just in case. All right, cool. Um, all right, so that should be the link for the next phone designs. Uh, you're going to have an intermediate and an advanced one in there. I believe you guys are going to get started with the intermediate one next. I don't think you're going to jump to the advanced one, but don't quote me on that. You'll know, you'll get a better idea from Mr. Dubik on Monday. Um, but with that in mind, uh, that's going to go ahead and do it for class today. I know that was uh, a nice little intermission, um, but you're going to be right back into phone case design on, uh, on Monday. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip the poll questions and we're just going to leave it open for question and answer time. I'm actually only going to ask one poll question, and then we're going to leave it open for question and answer time to close everything out. So after the poll question is done, singular, uh, if you have any questions about anything or you want to discuss anything, I'm here. Otherwise, you're more than welcome to head out. Have a wonderful weekend, and uh, you'll see Mr. Dubik on Monday.